Good afternoon. On behalf of the Lover's Lane Foundation and the Owen Linton Lecture Series Endowment, welcome back to day two of our 2022 Owen Linton Lecture Series. We are so glad you are here. You know, yesterday was an awesome day uh, as Bishop Harvey spoke to us about the great commandment and loving our neighbor. And speaking for me, I have to tell you, that's not always easy to love your neighbor. But as the bishop pointed out to us, what Jesus said is, it wasn't a mission statement, it wasn't a suggestion, it wasn't a guiding principle. Well, it might have been a little bit of those things, but more than anything, it was a command. Love your neighbor. I guess that's why I call it the great commandment, not the great suggestion. So, Bishop, thank you for that message. Uh, probably me more than anyone needed to hear that. Thank you so much. Yesterday, we dove deep into the great commandment, and today we're diving even deeper into the servant of all. You know, the Levers Lane Foundation has 48 different endowments that touch almost every aspect of our church. Three of those endowments are lecture series. In the fall, we have the SHIP lecture series, and the McCormick Lecture Series that alternate every other year. The Ship Lecture Series honors Tom Ship and brings us a clergy speaker each every other fall, and the McCormick Lecture series, series brings us a dynamic lay speaker every other fall. This past year, our own Admiral Brett Jura was our McCormick speaker, and he did a great job in bringing us an awesome message and next up will be our ship lecture series this fall, and we're working on the details for that, so be watching your inbox and your emails and your post office mailbox because uh, information will be coming up on that soon. And while those two lecture series are every other year, the Owen Linton lecture series is every year. Dependable, just like Arts and Babs Owen. Dependable and servants to all. Arch and Babs have really created a legacy with this lecture series, a legacy that helps get us from the joy of Palm Sunday to the resurrection on Easter Sunday, a legacy that helps us get through Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, a, leg a, a legacy that helps us de deal with the betrayal at the Last Supper and the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior to the hope of a new beginning to a savior for all of us, who laid down his life for us, to a savior that calls us to be a servant to all. And we all know here at Lover's Lane, when we say a servant to all, the all is in all caps, because we mean all. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to hear the bishop's message today about serving to all because it fits squarely into our wheelhouse here at Lover's Lane. And it fits squarely into the wheelhouse of the late Arch and Babs Owen. I want to recognize again today that Meredith, her Babs longtime caregiver, and uh, Meredith's cousin Jennifer are here. And Meredith's, I'm sorry, and Babs's grandson, David Owen. Would the three of you please stand and be recognized? And of course, I also want to point out that our own bishop, Bishop Mike McKee, is here today. I'm so glad to see him. It's funny, um, I was talking to Scott Luganbill in the back, and I said, you know, Bishop McKee is here. And I said, you know, I went up and shook hands with him, and I said, good morning, Bishop. And he said, good morning, Paul. And I, I said to Scott, I said, the bishop knows my name. <laughs> and Scott said, Paul, you've got on a name tag. <laughs> So welcome, Bishop. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we, we heard you here what, a week or 10 days ago, and that was awesome, too. So. so let's get started. I've asked Pastor Julius Collins to come and give us an opening prayer. And after that, Pastor Don Anderson will uh, read our scripture verses. And then Pastor Donna Whitehead will introduce Bishop Harvey today. So welcome. I hope you enjoy this. Babs and Arch are looking down on us right now, I'm sure. Amen. 
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, in whose presence our souls take delight, on whom in inflation we call, our comfort by day, our song in the night, our hope, our salvation, our all. We pause this time once again to recognize your grace, to recognize your presence, to recognize your power, to raise our hands to your heavens and say thank you for the love that you have bestowed upon us and that grace of yours that continues to sustain us. This is the time of the year when we once again can pause. Imagine you, gracious Lord, riding into Jerusalem, but choosing a donkey instead of a horse. To show that, gracious Lord, you had all the power but chose servanthood. As he rode into Jerusalem, entering the temple to challenge the powers that be. For us all to recognize, gracious Lord, it is that time of our lives that we too can submit ourselves to your leading because you chose to be a servant. Send the power of your Holy Spirit upon us today as we go through the events of the Holy Week that we will be servants, not just Lord and Masters. We pray now, gracious Lord, that you endow your servant, our Bishop, with wisdom and understanding and inspiration that the message you've given us, gracious Lord, will sink deep down into our hearts, that we will all leave from here today ready to be servants to everyone you bring our way. So let your Holy Spirit take charge and let your will be done in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand as you're able for the reading of scripture? The scripture comes from Mark 9, verses 35 to 37. Jesus sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I first have an invitation, and that is for all of us. Uh, The staff's going to lead the way, but everybody's invited. Thursday morning of this week, 1030, in the Dudley Dancer Room, which is right down the hallway, uh, we're going to meet with the bishop, to Bishop Harvey, to uh, talk about anything that we want to talk about, continue the discussion and process the week together. So all of you are invited to that, and we'd love to have you be a part of it. Oh, what a joy it is to get to introduce you today, Cynthia. This is fun. And um, I'm going to do a quick review, quickly. She was born into a Hispanic Catholic family that was very faithful, and she grew up in uh, West Texas in Big Spring in a home built by her father and her grandfather. She graduated from the University of Texas and spent 12 years in the corporate world before becoming a United Methodist and experiencing a call to ministry. 
She attended Perkins School of Theology here in Dallas and received in 2018 the Distinguished Alumni Award from Perkins. She became widely known in the United Methodist world as an associate pastor, I remember this clearly, at Memorial Drive United Methodist Church in Houston, where she organized in her church a way to help the refugees from New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast in 2005. Y'all remember that. So she was a big player of helping uh, the people deal with that. And then she was asked after that to be the Deputy General Secretary of the United Methodist Committee on Relief. We're so proud of this and the good work that they continue to do. From that position, she was elected bishop on one of the early ballots in 2012. She quickly rose in the ranks of the Global Council of Bishops, becoming first the secretary of the group, then the president designated, and then the president itself in November 2019. She was elected president of the United Methodist Church Council of Bishops becoming the first Hispanic woman to ever hold that position. Now, I do not have to tell you, after you hearing her yesterday and getting to know her, uh, that it was no accident that Cynthia is now president of this large, large group for such a time as this. Yes, I am clear it's God. It's God's call. And because God's given her all the right stuff. Someone yesterday called her a powerhouse. And, uh, and it is her, I mean, it is the gifts that she has given that are leading us through what she characterized yesterday as a hot mess <laughs> as we move forward. I think she's right. Uh, and she's not just leading. I mean, that would, she's leading the leaders. Get that. She's at the top of the top of the World Council of Churches. And we know that's not important and that it has its own challenges, but we must not forget what kind of role she's in right now and how God is using her in it. Uh, not only as in, in the world today do we need to address several issues, but one of those is still women in the church. Here in the state of Texas, in the Metroplex, there are still many churches that do not uh, allow women to preach or, and certainly not to be senior pastor of churches. So here comes Cynthia reminding us that there is a higher, more mature way where women stand with men, with each other, as we go forward, right? Yes. And I love the fact that she and Dean are such a wonderfully matched couple together. He is called in the same sense that she is, but in a different way. He's very comfortable with the behind the scenes, fill in the gap role uh, that is very helpful in their home. How wonderful. And that frees her up to be the very visible role of high level meetings with presidents and of colleges and bishops from all over the world. Yes. It's such a great modeling for us. It gives us the freedom to not live in the stereotypical roles of the past, but to live instead in our giftedness, to the gifts that God has given us. And finally, I want to remind you of something really, really important. Her visit this week reminds me of a visit uh, and its significance for the future of the United Methodist Church reminds me of a visit to Lover's Lane that occurred on January the 5th, 2020, right before the pandemic. Bishop Monde of North Katanga, Africa, spoke here in Asbury Hall. He started that day and I remember thinking, oh my goodness, this is really, really important. This is historic. For he spoke not only words of love and reconciliation and forgiveness, but he concluded by saying, the best, the most wonderful gift I can give you today is the gift of myself, my life, my journey, my maturity. I am a product, he said, of the United Methodist Church and its mission at its best. And I bring you that word of hope today and I want that to continue. Cynthia's visit is like that for us here at Lover's Lane and for the community. It is historic. It is something we will remember from now on. 
uh, because she not only is a great preacher, you know that, but also you bring us the gift of yourself, your journey, your past, uh, your ministry, your maturity. It's an incredible gift to us as a church because it reminds us once again what the Methodist United Methodist Church stands for at its very best, and it does give us that kind of hope for we are a global connection where everybody and everyone belongs. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for being here, for what you represent to us, and would you, we invite you to come forward as we welcome you. Donna and I go way back. Uh, we were both in a, uh, a group together and uh, learned a lot about each other. And I was holding my breath a little bit because she knows a lot about me. And I uh, wasn't sure uh, what she might say, but um, thank you. Uh, thank you. And it's great again uh, to be with you. And uh, I am so thankful for this opportunity. And, and I can now call you friends, right? I can call you friends because I have seen you. And I have heard some of your stories. And to me, that is a great gift, a great gift. And, and Don, I will say that all I got is what I got. Um, it's me. And so I just always pray that it's enough, that it's enough. So in case you were not here yesterday, here are scenes from our previous episode. You've seen that on television, right? So here are just a few things for you to remember uh, or to remind you one way or the other. More is said about this week in Jesus' life than any other. The Lenten season, eventually the resurrection, is the ultimate story of reversal. And remember I said yesterday that you can't go from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. you got to make the entire journey, and that's why you're here. I've chosen the Gospel of Mark because of his economy of words and his sense of urgency. He's constantly pointing us to the future. He does so succinctly. He doesn't mince any words, doesn't waste time. There's no fluff. There's no fluff. He uses variations of the word immediately 36 times, at least 36 times. It's in this week that Jesus encounters, remember yesterday, he encounters the lawyer who asks which commandment is the greatest, and he answers with the Shema, hear, O Israel, or in my terms, listen up, people, hear, O Israel, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, and you, remember, he didn't say kind of, sort of, maybe ought to, kind of love your neighbor. He said, you will love your neighbor. The lawyer affirms what Jesus says. Jesus affirms the lawyer. And he says, you have answered well, is what he says to this lawyer. Unlike, it's a little different than some of the other gospels. But the important thing is at the end of that story, the people were left speechless, dumbfounded. Nobody dared ask another question. And so we left here yesterday with the challenge of not only loving our neighbor, but even maybe more importantly, seeing our neighbor. So today, we're going to continue along uh, Mark's account of Jesus' last week. Wednesday is pretty silent in the week. But what I think I know is that there must have been some behind-the-scenes preparation for the Passover meal, for goodness sakes. I am for sure that... There were people buying groceries all over the place, right? They were buying food. They were at the Jerusalem version of Central Market, buying all the things that they could, or Kroger, or, or maybe those that didn't want to cook that night went to Eatly and bought all those prepared kosher meals in the refrigerated section. Then there was that last-minute trip to the Jerusalem Total Wine. 
for extra wine because they just found out that Uncle Joe was coming to the Passover. And you know how much Uncle Joe loves his Cabernet? Cleaning was going on. I can see everybody ironing and steaming tablecloths. Tables were being set. So while we don't know much about what Jesus was doing, my hunch is that while others were busy preparing for the Passover meal, Jesus was busy preparing himself for the Passover. So allow me to set the stage of how we get to this text for today. Remember, Jesus went up to the mountain where he was transformed, the transfiguration. Can you imagine, though, at that moment, if you know that story, Peter, James, and John are with him. Remember, they, they still don't get it. They still don't get it. Jesus' clothes were amazingly made bright, like they'd been washed in Clorox or OxyClean, as, as if they had been bleached, it says in the gospel. Bleached white says the gospel. Peter hears the voices of Elijah and Moses and wants to build three shrines, one for Jesus, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. Then they hear what we presume to be the voice of God. This is my son whom I dearly love. Listen to him. And just like that, they're gone. The voices are gone, it's radio silent, crickets. Jesus orders the disciples to tell no one what had just happened. Now, I've kept a lot of secrets in my life. Can you imagine keeping that one? Can you imagine keeping that to yourself? Then Jesus again uses the moment to try to teach them again. And we read the repeated phrase in verse 32. The disciples didn't understand this kind of talk and were afraid to ask him. We've all been there. Students in a class and we just don't get it and we're too afraid to, to raise our hand and, and ask the teacher, risking that the teacher will think that we're not very smart or certainly not smart enough to be in that class in the first place. The other day I was in a conversation with Andy Hendren. Uh, he is the head of West Path. West Path is the group that handles all our clergy and some staff pensions. We were talking about unfunded pension liability of all things. And I'm a creative person. Uh, unfunded pension liability is not something that I um, understand. And finally, I just took a deep breath <clears throat> and I said, Andy, I know I'm supposed to know all of this but I just don't understand. Can you explain it to me like a fifth grader? These disciples <clears throat> are not the sharpest tools in the shed. And they're afraid to ask questions, to ask Jesus to explain it to them like a fifth grader. They reach Capernaum, they go into a house, a house. We don't know whose house, just a house. And Jesus sits them down for a family meeting. <clears throat> what were y'all arguing about back there? Jesus knew what they were arguing about, but he wanted to hear it from them. They were arguing about who among them would be the greatest. Can you hear it? <laughs> he likes me best. Well, you know, he picked me first. I do everything he tells me to do. And Peter, you know, you always do stupid stuff. Like, you know, building three sh shrines back there on that mountain? Really? You're always thinking about these crazy ideas. Then Jesus turns to teacher again. And he says, whoever wants to be First, 
must be least of all and servant of all. Not servant of some, not servant of people you like, not servant of people who look like you or think like you, but servant of all. No echo chambers here, no silos, servant of all. Can you see the look? On the faces of the disciples? Explain it to me like a fifth grader rabbi. And he uses a child as an illustration, a real life parable. What Craig Hill in his book, Servant of All, calls a performed parable. You see, the the child in Jesus' lap has no advantage over anyone. And Jesus says, whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me isn't actually welcoming me, but rather the one who sent me. Like a fifth grader, please. You see, the entire death and resurrection narrative is about turning the world upside down. First will be last. Dead things live again. It's the world in reverse. And again, I'm thankful to Craig Hill for this. He says, to be somebody in God's economy, you must assume the role of nobody, a lowly servant This is what Jesus had already done, but what the disciples, still hoping for a favorable outcome in Jerusalem, could not yet perceive. Y'all, it's not just the disciples. It's us. It's us. We are them. It's hard to understand when things aren't what we usually expect them to be like. This is not the way we understand the world. The CEO doesn't take their place at the back of the room. They're not the lowest person on the food chain of financial success. In our churches, sometimes the most important person on Sunday morning is not the senior pastor. But the facility staff that prepared the sanctuary, the people in the sound booth in the back, the nursery worker who rocks that crying baby to soothe them. Not what we expect. Now, I know like many of you, um, I've cared for an aging parent. It's perhaps the most humble passionate and beautiful thing I have ever done. A total reversal. Here I have the privilege of caring for the very person who birthed me and who cared for me. Loving humility is perhaps the most appropriate word I can come up with. That moment when you need help and you reach for the one who by all definition humbles themselves to serve you. Everything, everything suddenly becomes backwards. Counterintuitive, counterculture, the last will be first. If there's one thing this week teaches us, is that we expected things to turn out one way, and they didn't, and they didn't. Instead, things are turned upside down. Now, I'm sure you watched, or at least I know you've heard, about this year's Oscars. Everybody's still talking about Will Smith and Chris Rock, right? Um, 
Who would have ever imagined that the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air would walk on a stage in the middle of a performance and slap anyone, much less Chris Rock? But in all of this commotion, I'm afraid most people missed probably the best presentation of the night. Lady Gaga and Liza Minnelli. Talk about reversal. Talk about humility. Lady Gaga's three words were lost. I got you. I got you. She said that several times. I got you, she said to Liza Minnelli. She gave Liza Minnelli center stage while she stepped away yet close enough to make sure she had her. This is what it means to humble ourselves before God, <laughs> the academy, <laughs> and the world who was watching that night. Three simple words, I got you. The star with the legend humbles herself. reversals. Jesus on a donkey, not a stallion. His followers were not learned scholars, but a bunch of stinky fishermen. And if we peek to the end of the story, Donna, you'll love this, you know this, women were the first evangelists, not the teachers of the law. The death and resurrection story is a story of reversal. Dead things can live again. Things are upside down, inside out. The last are first, lost are found. Darkness becomes light. This is the gospel story. This is the story of Easter people. An addict finds their way to recovery. A homeless person opens a shelter for other homeless people. The inmate lawyer, the inmate turns lawyer and defends the truth. A shrewd CEO with more money than the law should allow becomes a generous and extravagant philanthropist that changes lives forever. A comedian opens a hospital for children. A country under siege is led to defend itself in ways that most of us could have never imagined. The world is filled with these wholly inspired stories of reversal. Don't miss them. Don't miss them. Mark chooses to tell the backstory of dedicated disciples that were incredibly fallible, much like the readers of this gospel story still today. That's you and me. That's you and me. So what held these disciples back for so long? In part, maybe, or at least, it was their own natural human ambition. Their vision was distorted by their desire for earthly status. Had they seen the world as Jesus saw it, they would have realized that they had everything exactly backward. So what about you? What about me? What about us? What about us? Does our natural human ambition and our desire for earthly status distort our understanding of what Jesus is trying to do for us, in us, and with us? Now, this room is filled with people who have put themselves last I know, many times. 
and your courage and your humility has transformed people and communities around the world. Lovers Lane United Methodist Church. I've heard about you. I've read about you. You have put aside some of your own needs to help other people. You are leaders that have chosen to take your place at the back of the line so that the least and the lost could be served first. That's what it means to be servant of all. Not servant of some, but servant of all. It's in your mission. Loving all, and you're right, Paul, it's all caps. Loving all people into relationship with Jesus Christ. That's in your mission. You've got it written like in giant letters in this room down the hall. I believe Jesus is speaking to us right now. In Markan fashion, in this moment, whoever welcomes one of these children, homeless people, rich people, poor people, forgotten people, young and old people, straight people, gay people, conservative people, progressive people, Republicans, Democrats, independents, Addicts and inmates, whoever welcomes any of these in my name, welcomes me. Amen. Wow. What a call. What a challenge be servant of all. Thank you, Bishop Harvey, for that inspiring message as we dove deeper into how to be a servant of all. And thank you to all of you for being here today. I, I think Babs and Arch are looking down. They looked down on us yesterday with a smile on their face, I'm pretty sure. And today, I think those smiles are even bigger and brighter. A couple of reminders, um, we're having a sit-down lunch, a buffet lunch in Watson Hall right after our conclusion here. I hope you all can join us. If you need to go, we have go boxes where you can grab a lunch and take it with you back to your office or back home or wherever you need to go. Um, and during this uh, lunchtime, we'll actually have a question and answer session where Bishop Harvey will try to answer all the hard questions. I've already told Dean I have a question for him. Uh, I even kind of gave him a hint what it was for so he could think about it. Um, and also I want you to know tomorrow we'll be back here, same time, same place, same location, um, talking about the bread of the world and we'll be having communion here uh, tomorrow at our noon service. So Tomorrow, also, if you're interested, our uh, uh, Copeland House and Prayer Gardens will be open starting at 11 o'clock. If you want to drop by there and maybe connect a little bit with uh, the servant of all uh, before you come over here, I, you know, I, I know there'll be people there to us to sort of show you around, you know, sort of tour guides, if you would. Um, so, today we dove deeper into the servant of all. And tomorrow, we'll dive into the deepest waters with Bishop Harvey. So, will you stand with me as we join in, in our closing prayer? What wondrous love is this, hymn 292 in our hymnal. See y'all at lunch. <laughs>
often preachers leave some things on the cutting floor, right? And this was just too good to leave there. So just give me one more minute. I want to share this quote with you. Um, it's from Stephen Holmes. Jesus wasn't starting a new religion or even criticizing an old one. He was teaching a spiritual practice, the practice of radical kindness and trust in God. That's all. That's it. That's Jesus' teaching and ministry in a nutshell. Sounds nice and benign, huh? But if you practice radical kindness to everybody, including the poor, the sick, the outcasts, foreigners, incarcerated sinners, enemies, everybody. Well, it will turn all of society over. So yeah, religious and political authorities had reason to get rid of him. Holy Week reminds us that love is powerful. And love is revolutionary. And people with worldly power will always resist it. But we know love will win. Love will win. Say it with me. Love will win. So as you go from this place today, Go knowing that love will win every single time. That it is revolutionary, that it sets the world on its ear. And that is our call. It is our call to revolutionize communities, to teach them that love will win. So go and teach the world that love will win. Amen. Amen.